Yes, sir. Back in bed. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And honestly, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing after Jonas's um, illustrious talk. So I'll do my best to uh, deliver on a more practical side of uh, ACA usage. Um, so the talk is called Integrating Non-Reactive Legacy Code, the case of R, where R actually means the R programming language. And I'm a machine learning engineer at Alpine Data Labs here in uh, the, the Bay Area, in San Francisco, actually. So we all know that reactive is about responsive, scalable, event-driven, and resilient, at least those of you who read the reactive manifesto. Now, uh, just a quick recap of what that actually means, because people used to say, oh, oh, it's really marketing. It's not marketing. These are quite precisely defined terms. So let's just do a quick review to see what we wish to obtain and what we have to compromise on in certain cases. So event-driven is essentially asynchronous, non-blocking, and um, it basically optimizes your application around Amdahl's law, because Amdahl's law says that um, your application will be at least as slow as your um, um, part of the application that has to be serially executed. The rest can be paralyzed. And um, if you have blocking and, uh, calls or synchronous calls, you're wasting a lot of computing power. So yes, you cannot really distribute the, um, the um, serial part of your code, but you can at least utilize your um, hardware better uh, while um, otherwise your, your code would be blocking. Um, scalable, so as Jonas said, location transparency. And yes, of course, you could scale it up, uh, scale it out. Um, uh, by basically having a split brain between, say, Java Yodel concurrent on the one hand and, say, spring remoting or RMI or some other horrible thing um, um, uh, uh, in, a, in a distributed context. But obviously, that's not really very nice because uh, then you have to figure out um, you know, which part of the code uses one programming model, which part of the code uses another one. So it's not really very convenient. Um, and uh, you have to factor in the unreliability of the network. So that's really the key. And, 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 and you know, we go back to these eight, um, eight fallacies and so on. Um, resilient, so you have to isolate the failure. And um, when you think about the bulkhead pattern or just bulkheads in an actual ship, um, if, if part of the ship uh, starts uh, uh, absorbing water, the, the whole ship shouldn't sink, right? You should degrade gracefully. And, um, and the nice thing that ACA provides here is uh, not just the fault tolerance itself, but the nice um, ability to um, separate the service and the failure handling mechanisms, right? So instead of putting your try-catch blocks everywhere, you say, here's my supervisor. I, 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 I put my failure handling in one place, and the business logic is in another. And that's really cool. Um, so responsive, uh, latency is really important, clearly, as, as you're trying to scale. That's, that's a given, but uh, like Jonas men mentioned, that's not really a given in, in all these uh, impossibility theorems. Um, and you have to uh, gracefully handle congestion. And that's sort of what reactive streams that, that um, uh, came in ACA 2.4 are about uh, with back pressure and so on. So this is what we really want. Now, if everything were written in ACA, the world would have been phenomenal. But unfortunately, not everything is written in ACA, so we have to deal with it. Um, so first of all, not everything is an actor, right? If you're writing your own code, you can say, OK, it's, everything is going to be an actor. But in reality, you have third-party libraries, and you're not going to rewrite them. Um, and and um, sometimes, even if, if you have a lot of legacy code, um, you may wish, wish to refactor it because you at least have control over it. But it's still really hard. And you know maybe you want to get permission to, to do that refactoring. So you have to basically just live with it. Uh, now, the, the other problem is um, there are lots of blocking calls in existing technologies, whether it's you know, JDBC driver calls to databases or you know, calls to actually technologies that are not even on the JVM. Well, obviously, the, the database is not on the JVM either, unless it's Derby or something. But, but there are also other, other runtimes that you may need to call to because they provide some functionality. In this case, it's R, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, then the other thing is the problem of long-running jobs. So for example, <clears throat> if you have a directed acyclic graph, um, and 
you basically have um, um, you're on, on a particular node in the graph, and then there's a successor node, and the, and the node that you're currently executing has to complete to move to the next step. Well, maybe the, the successor um, you know, has a, um, that, that is waiting on this result has an ask call, right? Which basically you get the future and you're blocking on, on, on that, that future because you, you don't really know what to do unless that particular piece of, of data uh, arrives, right? So in that particular case, yes, you have a way to deal with, with, with waiting on a result, but if your timeout is huge and your network gets partitioned before that or you have some other failure, you don't really want to wait until the timeout. Um, that, that would be really horrible. So for example, in the R case, um, there could be jobs that are running Monte Carlo simulations or something and they're running for a whole day. So you could set a timeout to one day, but if your network gets partitioned or your VPN logs out or whatever in, in five minutes, then you definitely don't want to be blocking until your one day uh, timeout runs out because that would be really horrible. Um, so, so, so that's where, where I'm gonna mention heartbeats because if you, for example, have your remote actor on death watch, you can basically monitor for the terminated message and you can say, okay, well, I have a timeout of one day, but if the terminated message arrives, that means that uh, the fire accrual detector, however it's configured because it's configurable, um, um, and when it when it determines that uh, that uh, you know the other node is unreachable, then you can basically uh, uh, timeout. You know, basically end the, the processing before the timeout. Um, and not all the failures happen within the JVM. Well, that's kind of not our problem, but I'm going to show you that in this particular case, it's um, it's possible to uh, to to restart these external processes, and that's why Akaz. Um, uh, supervision is really great because once once um, the the failure is detected, I can actually use this uh, Java client for R to to fork a new R process. Uh, but in general, it's uh, there are lots of different problems that you have to deal with uh, when you're integrating with other technologies. I kind of feel like integrating Akka with R and basically the the whole JVM part of the application with R was a little bit like integrating maybe J2E back in the late 90s with System 360 or something. I mean, it's like that horrible, but it had to be done because there was business value there. So what is Alpine? I'm just gonna briefly mention what is Alpine because that sort of motivates this use case. So Alpine um, is an application that's, uh, that's uh, web-based and it, you basically use widgets um, to uh, create your directed acyclic graph of, of transformations. And these transformations can be based on uh, data uh, coming from databases or, or Hadoop. So in this particular uh, workflow, you have, let's say, a CSV data source um, uh, from HDFS called credit CSV. There's another one called demographic CSV. You perform a join. You don't actually have to write a hive query or a pig job or whatever. You basically say, okay, this is the common column and I'm just going to do a, you know, an inner join or something. And then you can do random sampling and, and select samples and apply a decision tree. So after you've done all your relational processing, you can basically apply a machine learning algorithm such as a decision tree or a or a, a, a linear regression, or, you know, uh, apply um, after prediction, you can apply your uh, receiver operating characteristic or lift or goodness of fit or whatever. So essentially it's, a, it's an end-to-end -end, uh, DAG of, 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 of jobs from relational to machine learning and, and you can do it all in, in this application by just moving widgets around and, and selecting options instead of actually writing code. Um, so that's sort of what Alpine does. And, and there's a lot of value in that. And yes, we have machine learning algorithms running in, in, in databases as stored procedures, and we have Spark jobs and so on. But the problem is writing machine learning algorithms that are distributed is, is extremely hard. It takes sometimes like three months to develop um, um, an algorithm, like a random forest, for example. And so we have probably something like 30 algorithms, but you will never replace R, which has approximately 5,000 algorithms. So, um, so uh, the, the goal here was to say, hey, we mostly do big data, but for small data, we want in, an integration with a tool that, uh, that provides you with all these uh, libraries out of the box. So sometimes you may have small data, but you, you, you have the richness of algorithms. So let's just uh, let's address that use case as well. 
Um, okay, so what are the, the, the cases for and against R? Because obviously it's a horrible technology to integrate with, with the JVM. So we have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, determine that, that the, uh, the values for, uh, the, the, you know, the arguments for R actually uh, outweigh the ones against. So R has 5,000 uh, statistical and machine learning libraries, and it, it provides the numeric gold standard for, for lots of implementations because the people who uh, uh, tended to write, to publish uh, uh, scientific journal articles actually um, did their, their first implementations in R, so unless they had a bug, you know, that would be probably the default impl implementation for a lot of new algorithms. Um, and it has a huge community, so you get peer reviews, right? A few people find bugs, they're usually detected really early on. Um, and the, the other benefit is data scientists already know the language. So, so the, the other benefit of, of the R operator was to essentially um, um, allow data scientists to do something that is not canned, right? Because here you have a pretty UI and you can select options that, that, that are provided. But what if you want to do something arbitrary? You want to uh, run a bootstrap algorithm or something that's not built into the, the, uh, these operators. Well, if you want to do something arbitrary, then you better provide the language that um, data scientists actually know. So it would be either R or Python. Um, uh, Python actually has way fewer libraries in it with scikit-learn and so on. R has more, more options. Um, so, and, and yeah, in R you can really focus on the data science as opposed to on coding because if you wanted to run a neural network or an SVM or whatever, you basically just, you know, running, running many algorithms is a one-liner once your data set is actually already there. And you know, writing something like that in Java using you know even existing linear algebra or libraries or something or optimization libraries it would be really a lot of coding. And uh, so that was the value. But the, the 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 stuff against it is the runtime is extremely slow. If you thought Python and Ruby were slow, then then uh, then try out R, and then then you'll be happy about Python and, and Ruby. Um, and it's really memory hogging because basically everything is by copy. There's, there's nothing really by reference in R. Um, you could say that in Haskell, basically everything is by copy, but the garbage collector is so fast that I think it garbage collects about one gigabyte per second, so you really don't even think about it very much. But, in, but R's garbage collector is extremely slow and it actually crashes sometimes, so it's really not that great. Um, the runtime is single-threaded, so you could say, you know, oh, we know lots of single-threaded runtimes like Python and Ruby. They're 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 at least not concurrent. They're actually multi-threaded, but they have a global interpreter lock, so they're still very slow. But at least you you can have, you can have multiple threads even if one thread is executing at, at a time. R is actually even worse because it's just one thread period, uh, and 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 you cannot even do time slicing. So if you have a problem, you won't even know that you, you're in in. A, in an infinite loop because nothing is monitoring what's going on. Um, so it's, it's a lot of problems, right? And these libraries were written by, not by CS graduates, they were written by statisticians. And because R was too slow, people started writing them in C++ or Fortran. And you know, you get seg faults because people uh, you know, overran the, uh, the index in an array or something. So it's, you have to really deal with a lot of nonsense. But the thing is, okay, so how do we integrate this horrible thing that's, that has business value, but it's just really not engineering quality into um, um, a, you know, an enterprise application, essentially. So, so the, and there are more challenges, actually, because R is GPL, right? So you cannot really ship it. Um, uh, you know, Alpine ships its software. It, it can also do software as a service, uh, technically, but but it, it ships its software because lots of companies like healthcare and financial companies have, have um, Hadoop clusters that are locked up behind their firewall and, and, and you basically have to ship the software. You cannot ship the software if it's GPL. Uh, the RServe connector, which is the Java library written by Simon Urbanik at uh, at and Research, uh, this one is actually LGPL, so it's you know considerably better. But still, um, there there were lots of concerns about licensing. So how do you decouple R as much as possible? Uh, and then the distributed computing aspect. So you really would want a cluster of R workers because, you know, if you have a, a, a concurrent database. Um, then um, the database queries can happen, you know, you can have multiple database queries happening at the same time if it's an MPP database. 
you know, Hadoop, uh, if, if these are small map reduced jobs, then you can probably have several of them happening at the same time, especially if you actually uh, divide the resources in your cluster to have concurrent jobs running and so on. Um, but you basically need several R workers. And um, if you use this R serve API, you can spin up several R processes on the single machine, but you cannot um, really um, have these processes running on different machines. You need some JVM to control these processes. You can only have several processes per JVM, but they're going to be on the same machine. So you, you would really want to distribute these JVMs to control these R processes. And then the other problem is um, REST is really great for data, but it's not, not really great for you know, writing business logic. Uh, I guess you know, on the one hand, distributed objects were a horrible idea, but at, at the same time, they had some structure. If you have to basically figure out, oh, what is my endpoint going to be and what are my four methods going to do you know, to basically abstract an arbitrary program, that's really hard. If you have ACA and you have, you know, you can define special case classes for every type of message to do a particular thing, that's much easier than, than, than thinking about, oh, what is my routing going to be for, for this REST stuff and, you know, which of the four methods am I going to use and blah, blah, blah. So, um, and then the other issue is uh, you cannot really request you cannot make too many requests at a time because R expects a lot of data to be coming into it. You know, the, 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 um, an arbitrary node on the cluster is not going to read you know, a CSV file from disk. You have to send it the data. So you either do it through REST or you actually have to push the data through ACA as an actual object. So in, in either case, you want to have um, either back pressure or you, you want to have sessions and basically say, hey, this worker is unavailable until, until it's done with its you know, several hours of Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, uh, back pressure actually would have been preferred, but the problem is that we're using uh, the ACA version 2.2.3, which is the one that Spark uses. Otherwise, we would have a jar help problem. So unless Spark actually catches up with, with ACA uh, and, and, and uses a newer version, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, you could start using cl uh, custom class loaders or some other crazy thing, but it would be nice to just have one ACA version um, in the application. Um, so back pressure was out of the question, unfortunately, for now. Um, and uh, fault tolerance. Okay, so, so R fails all the time, right? You have seg faults because the, the statistician wrote poor C++ code or something. You have network partitions, so, or, or you could, in theory, your VPN could disconnect, whatever. So, so you have all kinds of problems. So what are the solutions? Well, first of all, from the licensing perspective, because without that, it wouldn't make even any sense to even try it out, right? If you can't ship it, then you just don't do it. So Akka is Apache 2.0. And our service is LGPL, but people said, well, let's do a license with GPL. What if the guy removes the, 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 LGP, the LGPL license or something? So, so essentially, the best way to, to, to decouple it would be to say, OK, I have my JVM that talks to R, and I open source that part of the application because it's just a connector to R, really, that most of the business logic is on the Alpine side. So we open source this connector that, that, uh, that um, um, talk communicates between the uh, the closed source application and 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 this open source component that simply controls the R workers. Um, so that can be open sourced. Um, but then, uh, because you have loose coupling, you can just send these open source messages between between the application if they're open source and they're you know let's say Apache licensed or you know creative licensed or whatever, you basically are, you can reuse them in your, in your closed source application. So ACA actually provides this decoupling for, from a licensing perspective, which is pretty cool. Um, and from a distributed computing perspective, ACA provides location transparency. So again, you don't have to think about, oh, am I doing Java to concurrent? Am I doing, um, uh, you know, some crazy RMI or some other, you know, spring remoting or REST or something like that, right? Um, and um, the cluster API actually would have been really nice. However, again, we're using an old version of ACA, so that's not really quite available at the moment. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you can structure the, the uh, provide structure and semantics by having specific messages for specific problems. And again, um, uh, reactive streams or, or back pressure would have been nice, but we have an old ACA version, so we have to deal with that ourselves. 
Um, from a fault, fault tolerance perspective, the RServe Java API actually allows you to start new um, R processes to basically fork them the moment you create an R connection object. So that's nice. And if Akka handles fault tolerance, then um, basically upon failure, you can use, you can use the, uh, the, the R handling to, to create new R processes. The key thing I think that Akka provides here um, as well is that Firecrawl um, failure detector. Um, because if you can subscribe to uh, terminated messages by, by basically having death watch over the remote actor, um, it's not just when that actor terminates in an unclean way, it's also when the, the network disconnects. Um, so, so you will get locally the terminated message when, when the network is no longer available. Um, and that's great because in many cases, it's not about guaranteed delivery or anything like that. You at least want to tell the user, hey, your network is down. Or maybe um, in this particular case, it's not a you know, banking transaction or anything like that. You at least, but, but you want to tell the user in the UI, you actually need to rerun this workflow because a failure occurred. So if, if you could do at least that, that's, that's where Heartbeat actually helps. And it also prevents you from waiting until the timeout is up, right? Because if your timeout is one day and your network disconnects after five minutes, you would rather actually terminate the flow immediately when, when, the, when the disconnection happens. Um, and yes, we don't need exactly one semantics and all of that stuff that's really kind of fictitious. Storm tried it and I'm not quite sure if, if it worked out. Okay. So sessions, okay, this is a really horrible, horrible, horrible solution. But uh, basically because, because uh, there was no possibility of having, um, of having this back pressure um, and, the, and, the, and the data sets are actually moving through ACA, they're not moving through REST because the REST API uh, uh, um, of the backend of the application wasn't complete because you know, we weren't exposing it to external users so we didn't really pay attention to that. Uh, sessions basically are sort of like a, in this case, like a poor man's version of um, of back pressure. Basically, um, you know, you get you get a, the, the consumer actually sends a message back saying, "Oh, this session is done. Send me new data." Um, but of course, had the had the back pressure already been there, um, have, had we been able to use a newer version of Akka, that wouldn't have been necessary. And also had REST been in, in use instead for data movement, then, then you wouldn't have to deal with that. But that's coming in the next release of, uh, of Alpine's product. Um, also, uh, the, the important thing to remember is in Akka, you have to send, set the message sizes. So uh, if, if you have a configuration for two different nodes and you, by, you accidentally set diff two different message sizes, then it may be the case that you know, the message can get dropped because the, the message size was inconsistent. Of course, you know, it's, it's in your best interest to basically reuse the configuration to be consistent, but I'm actually checking that the other server has the same message size. If not, I'm basically taking the minimum of the two. It's really trivial. I mean, you just send a case class, right? You, you just have, a, have another case in your pattern matching to, to, uh, to, to poll, right? Because you can get the value of, of the message size from the type safe config. So that's, again, kind of hacky, but it's, it actually helps you prevent really stupid mistakes on behalf of users who configure two nodes differently. Um, let's see. So. So let's move through that. Okay, so this is really basically a very simple diagram. The, the Alpine web app um, is running on one node um, and it actually communicates with a so-called Alpine agent through Akka as well. Um, and the, the, res the reason for this agent ar architecture is that we have to support different Hadoop versions. Map R and Cloudera and Pivotal and Hortonworks and Apache. And the other problem is, the problem is really not the vendors, except for Map R, which actually uses a different file system. But the real problem is that between different versions of, um, of Hadoop, the RPC protocol for HDFS changed. So you really, you, you, you have the same package name, right? And you end up with a jar hell. You cannot really load all of these packages into one. 
one node, so you essentially end up with um, with with agents, and and depending on the Hadoop version for a particular workflow, you communicate to a different agent. And in fact, you could have different clusters for the same user, and one job can run on Cloudera CDH4, another one can run on Pivotal HD2 or whatever, and, and it can all work because of this agent architecture. So the agent and the, the web app actually communicate through, um, through Akka already. And then the agent talks through Akka to the R server, which is another JVM, and, um, and that JVM um, has these R connection objects, which basically provide the, the TCP bridge between um, R and, and the JVM. And, and, these R, and these actors within the R server control the R processes. So if the R process dies, you know, and, and the, the, uh, the, the um, actor that communicates directly with R doesn't actually uh, handle the failure, then its supervisor will, and it will restart that worker, and so on. So you get all that ACA fault tolerance. And because these, uh, these R connection objects actually when they're instantiated, they fork a new um, uh, uh, R process that provides you with uh, a way of dealing with the problem when the process actually fails, which is pretty often. But because, because you have data in, in HDFS, you know, the, or in the database, the data won't get lost, right? The only problem that you have is that you have to rerun that workflow, but you're not losing any data. And these are batch processes anyway, so it's not a big deal. The, the big deal is really coordinating the whole thing and making sure that you, know, you don't have dangling resources and so on. But, so that's where Akka really shines, and, 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 and this coordination really. So you basically set the number of actors and the timeout limit and you know, your remote deployment with protobuf sizes and so on. Oh, it, I guess it's too much code, but essentially you have this rserve master and in this particular case it actually handles the session. So it's kind of like a custom router. Um, um, had, it, had, had we had you know, the back pressure, we really wouldn't have to do that. Um, and um, other than that, it's all really simple. You have a supervisor and so on. Um, and in this particular case, I'm just showing you this, this, this situation where you basically check whether all the sessions are busy or not. And again, that wouldn't have to be done if we had uh, the ACA version with, with back pressure. We, you, would, you would just send as many requests to the, to the queue as possible, and it would they would just you know, get serially addressed. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm basically almost done. It's 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 really essentially the end. So, so yeah. This is basically a case where you just check the the, the frame size uh, for protobuf um, uh, on two nodes to make sure that you're actually not, you know, you don't have a bigger frame size on one node and then the other node will actually fail to receive it. Uh, let's see. And you have a supervisor which handles all these exceptions. And this particular R actor actually processes these requests, enriches the R script a little bit, um, and, and is able to start the worker and, and, and send the data to R, send the request, get the results back. So, I mean, I'm not really gonna go through the code. The slides will be available. Uh, let's see, but the key thing that I wanted to also um, point out is that Akka has a phenomenal um, test kit and it's really great not just for trivial cases where you basically have one request at a time, but it's also, uh, which is for unit tests, but it's also great for integration tests because you can basically test um, uh, concurrent um, behavior and that's really, really nice. Um, um, the one thing that I wanted to point out here is you could do something like, like I did here, which is you could actually mock, um, let's see, do I have the mock here? Yeah at the top. I just used Makito here because I, I didn't want to get bothered at, 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 at I didn't want the uh, unit test to become integration test, so I, I basically mocked the behavior of the R process, which is not really available at the moment uh, on, my, on my dev machine. And of course, at, at integration test time, you can, you can make calls to the actual R process. But you know, Makito and Scala mock and all of these things play really well with Scala test, and, and, and Scala test plays really well with um, with uh, the ACA test kit. And it's really important to test out these things because as you know, it, you know, we have reliability issues and concurrency issues and you just want to make sure that your application works really well. And it would have, would have been extremely hard to test ACA without the test kit and the test kit is really phenomenal. So I just wanted to just say that, that I'm really glad that it exists. Um, 
So I guess future improvements, data movement through REST, when it actually gets fixed in, in the back end, because the reason it didn't get fixed is, is because we're not really exposing it to anybody else, but we will uh, pretty soon. And then a replacement of sessions with reactive streams and actually come on, which is which uh, I guess replaces the type safe console for monitoring um, um, actor systems. And about a week ago, um, I got news from Ivan Topolniak, who develops Come On, that it's now also supporting, it, it, they have a beta version of, su of support for uh, remote actors and for, um, and for cluster, for the cluster API. And that's really great because so far they, you could only monitor actors on one machine. And, uh, so I guess I can I can just skip all this, but um, you know Aka really made made this so much more convenient. Thank you very much. I just want to say one last thing, actually two. First of all, Alpine is hiring, and we're looking for machine learning engineers who work in Scala and Java. Hopefully, just in Scala for the new code, but we still have you know some legacy Java code to deal with. Hopefully, we'll be porting it over all to Scala. Data scientists who mainly work with R and Python and um, Front-end developers, um, unfortunately, it's mostly Ruby and Rails at this point. Some JSP on the on, on part of the application. Uh, I wish it were Play, but um, but that's what it is. Um, and also, I wanted to uh, make an announcement on behalf of Michael Slynn, who um, is the creator of ScalaCourses.com. He is looking for reviewers. I'm actually uh, a volunteering as a reviewer. I mean, the only thing you get is, is uh, you know gratitude, and mention, you get mentioned on the slides that or basically in the, in the content of, 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 of his um, courses that, that you are a reviewer, you know, there's no monetary com compensation. But I think it's really important to share the knowledge and, and I'm basically just volunteering as a reviewer for him. And he asked if I could share that he's actually looking for re reviewers at this time. So um, I guess that's it. All right, thank you.